Hi everyone, welcome to this Econ 302 lecture about monopoly and price discrimination. In this lecture, I will go over monopoly first with the definition, the objective, the sources. Then I'll move on to a basic model where uniform pricing is going to be used. So what is the profit maximizing quantity and price when the firm is in a monopoly? I will also cover the case where instead of charging only a per unit price, the monopolist can also propose a two part tariff composed of an entry fee and a per unit price. We're going to see how the monopolist can increase its profit by um, doing so under a um, specific condition. Then I will move on to price discrimination. I'll talk about three different types of price discrimination. First degree is also called perfect price discrimination. Second degree is also called indirect price discrimination. And third degree is also called direct price discrimination or group discrimination. Let's get into the monopoly. A firm is in a monopoly or a firm is a monopolist if it is the only firm in the market. No other firm produces the same good or a close substitute for it. It is important to mention the uh, absence of a close substitute because facing another firm with a close substitute means facing competition. Coca-Cola, for instance, is the only one to produce their Coca-Cola bottles. But Pepsi-Cola has a pretty close substitute for it. And Coca-Cola is not a full monopolist it is facing some competition. In general, the degree to which goods are substituted with each other is measured by the cross price elasticity of demand. This is the percentage change in the demand for one good if the price of another good increases by 1%. In real life, there are only a few pure monopolies. In general, a monopoly faces a downward sloping demand. So charging a high price means selling a lower quantity and vice versa. What's specific about a monopoly is that increasing the price does not mean losing all of the demand. Because the monopolist is the only firm to produce on the market, it has market power. If it increases the price, it might sell less, but it won't sell zero. So this leads us to the definition of market power. Market power is the ability to charge a price above the marginal cost. Remember that in perfect competition, price is equal to marginal cost and firms profits are pretty much zero. Market power is the ability to charge a price above the marginal cost in order to generate profits. Like any other firm, the monopolist is going to maximize its profits or the producer surplus. Remember the producer surplus definition? The difference between the price producers sell the good at and the price they are willing to sell it at. Equivalently, it is equal to profits plus fixed costs. The objective of the monopolist is not only to maximize profits, but also to extract consumer surplus. The consumer surplus is defined as the difference between price consumers are willing to pay and the price they actually pay. It is also equal to utility minus price paid. Monopolies can find various sources. The first one of them could be government policy. Some firms might be in a situation of monopoly and they might be owned by the government or the state, in particular when it comes to utilities. Some firms might end up being in a monopoly because the government allows them to be so. This can be due to patents, if a firm discovers, let's say, a new drug or um, anything that is innovative, the firm can buy 
the right to be the exclusive producer of this innovation from the government for a certain period of time. It is the same for copyrights. A studio will uh, buy or will obtain the rights to be the sole distributor of its own products, like a movie or a music album. It is the same with trademarks. If you build um, a firm, if you start a firm, you need to declare the name of the firm, which you need to do um, at the government level. And it's the same for licenses like nightclubs and cable and so on. Sometimes firms might end up being in a monopoly because of a large efficient scale. Some industries are characterized by economies of scale. In particular, um, gas, electricity, water uh, are markets which are characterized by economies of scale. Remember, economies of scale are a situation where the average cost of production, the per unit cost, is decreasing as quantity produced increases. We encounter economies of scale in new firms very often because when firms are uh, at the start of their activity, increasing the um, production scale resu will result in reduction in the per unit costs. There is always a moment where um, hiring extra employees or um, to produce extra units will actually end up being less, less costly per unit. There is also a point where, think about the warehouse that is fully being used, that has reached capacity, that's going to be a point where if the company wants to produce one extra unit of the good, it needs to make either some investments or hire extra employees and so on. But this will result in an increase in the per unit cost. Some industries are characterized by economies of scale the whole time. In particular, <clears throat> electricity, gas, um, transportation via railroad and so on. Those are industries that are characterized by a very big investment in network and infrastructure that is costly to maintain. But one additional user is usually not very costly. So the marginal cost tends to be low, but there is a huge fixed cost to uh, pay before even starting the activity. In such industries, it is, well, it is natural that there is one firm producing more because it is cheaper per unit than two firms producing, let's say, half each. So naturally, in those industries, monopolies arise and they are in general regulated. Monopolies could emerge through network externality on the demand side. So. Many products have what we call um, network effects or network externalities. Additional users of the product will give incentives to non-users to start using the product. And in, for instance, software. A software like Microsoft Office is um, going to produce network externalities because the more users there are on Microsoft Office, the more interesting it is for non-users to get on it for collaborative purposes. Think about trading cards at recess in, in, uh, in middle school or primary school. The more kids with Dragon Ball trading cards, the bigger the incentives for a non-owner of cards to buy some and start trading. And the more users there are, the more interesting it is for the outsiders. Twitter, YouTube, those platforms are gaining more and more interest as there is a um, high traffic. YouTube used to compete with other uh, platforms 10 years ago. One of them is French called Dailymotion. It still exists. It has not many videos and um, pretty poor quality. Because YouTube pretty much won the race. As the number of users on YouTube increased, YouTube became more and more appealing to any non-user. 
and eventually now whenever you're talking about watching a video first thing you think of is YouTube unless it's from a specific platform like TikTok or uh, Instagram but it's the same thing for TikTok and Instagram the more users they are the more interesting it is for non-users to get on board sometimes firms can become monopolists as a result of their behavior some firms might be in control of an essential input the beers or the, the beers cartel is a firm that owns around 80 percent of the diamond resources on the planet so most of the diamond jewelry is coming from the beers simply because they control the uh, supply of diamonds some firms are simply being more cost efficient than others and they adopt predatory behaviors to drive some firms out of the market if it's that cheap to produce a good for a firm which is well established this firm might want to to impose very low prices until the newcomers are not making any profit anymore and they exit the market leaving the incumbent as the sole supplier in the industry Walmart and Microsoft in particular have done a pretty good job at that um, over time so let's go over the basic um, uniform pricing model I will denote Q uh, I will denote by Q the quantity sold, the output, and P the price per unit. A monopolist, first and foremost, needs two things. He needs to know his own costs, and he needs to know the demand. I will start with the inverse demand function, P as a function of Q. It is aggregate and downward sloping. So the derivative of P with respect to Q, denoted with a prime here, P prime, is lower than zero remember if the derivative is negative it means that the tangent to the function is going down so the function itself is going down and vice versa if the derivative is positive the function is increasing and if the derivative is zero then the function reached either its peak or its trough it depends In order to compute its profits, the monopolist needs its revenue and its costs. Total revenue is the same thing as sales, price times quantity. From there, I can compute the average revenue by dividing the total revenue by Q, which gives me P of Q. On average, each unit sold yields P dollars. And the marginal revenue, remember, Every time we hear marginal, we are thinking about derivatives. The marginal revenue is then the derivative of the total revenue function with respect to Q. Since Q appears both inside the demand here and outside as the quantity, you're going to have to use the product rule. Make sure you know how to use it. It's going to be very useful in this class. Now, the second part of the profit function is going to be the cost function. The total cost function depicts the cost associated to producing Q units of the good. The marginal cost is going to be the derivative of the total cost with respect to Q. It is the cost uh, incurred by the company from producing one extra unit of the good. And we will label it C prime or MC. It's a cost, so it cannot be lower than zero. The profit function is then P of Q times Q sales minus total cost. The monopolist will look for the quantity Q star that is going to maximize this profit function. To do so, we are going to take the first order condition. There is one variable to solve for, so there's going to be one first order condition. The first order condition says that 
you reach the maximum of the profit function when its derivative is equal to zero because you reach the top of the mountain. But you do not reach the top of the mountain at any quantity q. Rather, we are going to define the profit maximizing quantity as qm. So this equation is satisfied only when q is equal to qm. If you keep going with the math, you take the derivative, we get the first part, which is the marginal revenue, and the second part, c prime of qm, which is the marginal cost. If you put this marginal cost here to the right hand side of the equation, you get that the optimal quantity qm satisfied satisfies marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. You can either derive the first order conditions every time or directly jump to this formula to find the uh, profit maximizing quantity for a monopolist. Once you have the quantity qm, you can plug it into the inverse demand function to get pm, the corresponding optimal price. So the general rule is the monopolist chooses the quantity where the marginal revenue equals marginal cost and charges the maximum price that bears that quantity. Now, let's play around with this formula a bit longer to derive a very interesting result. To derive this result, I'm going to need to recall the price elasticity of demand. It is a percent change in the demand or in the quantity consumed after a 1% increase in the price of the good. It is defined as the derivative of Q with respect to P times P over Q. Turns out that the derivative of Q with respect to P is the same as the inverse of the derivative of P with respect to Q. It is in general negative because if the price increases even by 1%, we should not expect quantities to increase. Playing around with the former condition that marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, if you factorize by PM, you can make eta P, the elasticity of demand, appear. And after some manipulation, you can get the following formula that says, on the left hand side, price minus marginal cost over price when the quantity is QM, so at the profit maximizing quantity, is equal to 1 over minus the price elasticity of demand. Note that since eta p is in general negative, or by definition negative, then having a minus in front is going to make the right hand side positive. And it makes sense because the left hand side should be positive as well. But for the, right, for the left hand side to be positive, price should be higher than marginal cost. The left part of this rule is called the price cost margin, or it's also called the learner index. It is a measure of market power. Remember, market power is the ability to charge a price above the marginal cost. Here, the top of the left part, which is P minus marginal cost, is a measure of market power. Here, it's being divided by the price, so it's turned into a percentage. Note that the elasticity is also a percentage. So the left hand side is a measure of how much proportion of the price is going into the monopolist profits after paying everything. To give you an example, imagine I sell a pair of shoes that I made for $30. So P would be equal to 30. The marginal cost of making shoes is equal to $20. This is how much it costs me to make that last pair of shoes between getting the leather, getting the equipment, and getting all the hours of work in. Then the left-hand side would be equal to 30 minus 20 
over 30. That's equal to 10 over 30 or one third or 30%. 33.33%. This percentage is the percentage of the price that is going to the monopolist's pocket in the form of profit. The remaining two thirds, 66.67%, are what is being used to pay for the costs, to pay for the labor force, the equipment, the leather, and so on. Note that the higher the elasticity, so if eta p is high in magnitude, in absolute value, then the right hand side will be low. One over high will be low. And it means that the left hand side also has to be low. So if the monopolist is facing a demand which is very elastic, then it cannot charge a price above the marginal cost too much. Why? Because as the demand is elastic, any increase in the price will lead to a very high decrease in the quantities. So the monopolist cannot afford charging a very high price because he's going to lose too much on the quantity side. On the other hand, if the demand on the market is rather inelastic, so eta p is small, and by small I mean closer to zero, close to zero, then one over something close to zero will be high bigger than one and so the left hand side will be big as well so if the demand is inelastic then the monopolist can afford to try to charge a high price way above the marginal cost because it won't lose too much in terms of quantity this rule only applies for monopolist at the optimum so this rule is not satisfied for any Q. It's only at QM, the profit maximizing quantity. You can see here as well that the monopolist has market power, but his market power is only dictated by the elasticity of the demand. If the demand is very elastic, the firm could be in a monopoly it won't be able to charge a very high price because it will lose too much on quantities. So the monopolist stays disciplined by the demand. Note, furthermore, that since C prime is bigger than zero, the left hand side of the equation cannot be bigger than one. Price minus marginal cost of a price will necessarily be a proportion. It will be between 0 and 1. If it's between 0 and 1, it means that eta p has to be bigger than 1 in absolute value for the right hand side to equal the left hand side. This means that the monopolist chooses his quantity to produce, qm, where in the area where the demand is particularly elastic. This is what's going to show here. Imagine the case of a linear demand. The demand is given by A minus BQ. There is a marginal cost which is increasing. And the marginal revenue is going to be A minus 2BQ. The monopolist looks for the point where marginal revenue crosses marginal cost, which is at this point. This gives qm and the corresponding pm will be once we align once we plug q into the demand function and we get pm qm this point here now on the second graph i plotted the total revenue since the demand is linear total revenue is going to look like a quadratic function because it's a minus bq times q if you expand you're going to get aq minus b q squared because there's a minus in front of the q squared then it's going to be an inverted u shape rather than a u shape you can see that there's a maximum 
it is going to be where the marginal revenue function is equal to zero, when the tangent to the function is flat. It turns out that when the marginal revenue is equal to zero, we are at this point here, which is equal to a over 2b. So this is why this point here corresponds to the point where q is equal to a over 2b. Note that qm is to the left of a over 2b. And if you look at the location of qm on the right graph, you can then see that qm is located on the left part of the total revenue graph, which is a part where the marginal revenue is increasing. The slopes here every time are upward sloping. So let's relate this to the concept of elasticity. To compute elasticity, remember, I want to get Q as a function of P. Since I have P as a function of Q here, I need to invert my relationship to get Q as a function of P. Okay, then I can compute the elasticity by taking the derivative of this expression with respect to P times P over Q. I replace P by its expression of Q so that my, my elasticity only depends on Q. Note that since A minus BQ is positive, because this is the price, the elasticity has a minus in front of it. It is a negative number. So imagine the case of an elastic demand. The demand is elastic if eta P is lower than minus one, or in absolute value, it's bigger than one. So it is the case where this formula here is bigger than one. When does that happen? That happens if Q is lower than A over 2B. So when Q is on the left part of the graph, lower than A over 2B, then we are in a part where the marginal revenue is bigger than zero. If the elasticity is what we call unitary, it's exactly equal to minus one, then if you just plug that in here, you get that it corresponds to the case where Q is equal to A over 2B. So where the marginal revenue is equal to zero is at A over 2B. And at that point, the elasticity is unitary. If there is a 1% increase in the price of the good, there will be an equivalent 1% decrease in the quantity sold. Finally, the case of an inelastic demand. Demands are inelastic when the elasticity is between zero and one in absolute value or between minus one and zero. This means that for instance, a 1% increase in the price would lead to a 0.5% decrease in the quantity. And that will correspond to the case where Q is bigger than A over 2B, which is the right part of the graph, which is the part where the total revenue is decreasing or marginal revenue is negative. You can use your intuition as well. Think about it. Imagine that a Imagine a case where the monopolist is producing a quantity beyond A over 2B. It means that in that area, the demand is inelastic. So if the monopolist decides to increase the price a tiny bit, the demand will not decrease by that much. So the monopolist will actually have an incentive to keep producing, to, sorry, to increase the price because there won't be such a loss in demand. Eventually, after taking into account the costs as well, the monopolist will end up on the left part of the graph where elasticity is actually bigger than one. So demand is actually elastic. The monopolist pretty much wants to push the price upwards until it gets to a moment where the elasticity of demand is too high and any further increase would lead to a big decrease in the quantity sold.
Here are a couple of elasticities of demand estimates made by um, someone at Harvard. I don't remember who. I think it dates back to 2014 or something like that. So all of these numbers, first of all, are negative. The minus was taken away because we know that elasticities of demand are negative. I want to draw your attention to the first three items, salt, matches, and toothpicks. Salt is used every day by almost everybody. Matches and toothpicks, it really depends on people. But what those three things have in common is that they are pretty cheap already. So their elasticity of demand is also rather low. If the price of salt increases by 1%, then the, the salt consumption will decrease by 0.1%, which is small. Note that elasticities tend to be higher when the price is high. There are cases where the elasticity of demand is constant, but there are also cases, marginal cases, where it varies with the quantity and the price, like it does in this slide. You see here, eta p really depends on what q is equal to. a and v are parameters, they don't change. But if q is equal to 1 versus q is equal to 2, the elasticity will not be the same. Another case I want to draw your attention to is gasoline in the short and long run. Gasoline consumption in the short run is less elastic than in the long run. The reason is, in the short run, it is difficult for consumers to just readapt their, um, their travel modes to accommodate for the increase in the price of gasoline. If today I tell you that from tomorrow on the price of a gallon is going to be uh, that much higher, then, or barrel, then um, in, for the next week, you will probably consume as much gasoline as you used to. But in the long run, once you have time to adjust, if this price increase is persistent, then you might decide to switch to maybe an electrical vehicle or a hybrid model, or maybe you might decide to take the bus more and the SkyTrain more. Hence, a higher elasticity of demand for gasoline in the long run. And there's a couple more. Uh, elasticity of demand for coffee is, is pretty small, 0.25%. That's due to the fact that coffee is, coffee is used in, uh, is consumed by everybody, especially in, in North America. And caffeine is a bit addictive too. So some people cannot go on with their day without their fix of caffeine. Fresh tomatoes have a huge elasticity. So do restaurant meals, 2.3. So this shows you that they are also substitutes. In the presence of substitutes, elasticities are going to be higher. If the price of restaurant meals increases, then consumers might just decide to cook at home because there is another substitute or to buy a sandwich on the way, but not an actual meal. Price elasticity of demand is pretty high for tomatoes, suggesting that there are multiple substitutes for it. If tomatoes are too expensive, consumers will just switch to other fruits and veggies. How does it look on a graph? On the left-hand graph, I show the perfect competition outcome. So on the left-hand graph, price equals marginal cost. So P star equals exactly to marginal cost. At this price, a quantity Q star is being consumed, and the consumer surplus will be the blue triangle, and the producer surplus will be the red triangle. Now, the right graph is the one under monopoly. The monopolist is going to look for the area where MR is equal to MC, which is this point. This point will deliver QM, and once plugging QM into the inverse demand, you can obtain PM, the price. At this price and quantity, the consumer surplus has shrunk a lot 
It used to be this big triangle in perfect competition. Now it's equal to this small triangle. The producer's surplus has increased. Being a monopolist, now the firm is making positive profits. Each unit costs PM and the monopolist is going to sell QM of them. So the total revenue will be this big rectangle, but the firm needs to take into account its marginal costs so that the actual producer surplus will be equal to this trapezoid. And remember, if there is no fixed cost, then this producer surplus is equal to the profits. There is an area that doesn't go to either consumer surplus or producer surplus, the green area, the green triangle to the right of QM. This surplus used to be shared, as you can see here on the perfect competition graph. However, because the monopolist is restricting the output to QM, all of this surplus will not go to anybody. The outcome is not Pareto efficient. Let's go back to the definition. An allocation is Pareto efficient if there is no other allocation that makes somebody better off without making somebody else worse off. Why is it Pareto inefficient here? Each unit of the good is sold at a price PM. Consumers, however, are willing to purchase extra units of the good after QM if the price is lower than QM. Interestingly, firms are also willing to sell extra units after QM and the price they're willing to sell the good for is lower than the price consumers are willing to pay. So technically here, all those points are points where the good could be purchased in extra units at a different price every time and that would make both the consumer and the producer better off. However, here we have uniform pricing. The price is the same for everybody, it's PM. If it's PM, then consumers do not want to uh, consume any amount beyond QM. What if the producer decides to charge a lower price than PM, like let's say here? Yes, consumers will increase their surplus but the producer will actually lose more profits than it will gain. If it produces here, it will gain a bit of the green area, but he will also lose uh, the upper part here, which is gonna go to consumers. QMPM is the couple that maximizes the monopolist's profits. Now, so far I talked about a linear pricing or a uniform price. It's a price per unit and that's it. The monopolist could in fact change his uh, type of tariff and increase his profits. He could, for instance, propose a two-part tariff composed of a fixed entry fee plus a per unit price. There are many real life examples of these, cable and the phone, Sometimes you have to pay for a general subscription and then you pay per unit of what you want to consume. Same with utilities such as gas and electricity or amusement park or nightclubs. If you go to a nightclub, you have to pay for a cover fee at the entrance and then you have to pay for your drinks inside. For amusement park, if you think about the Pacific Northwest exhibition, p and &E, you pay an entrance fee at the, at the entrance and then inside you have to buy your own tickets to get access to the rides and to the food. How can that help the monopolist increase its profits over uniform pricing? Going back to the previous graph, but this time I made a uh, constant marginal cost, just to make things um, simple. Pi M will then be the uh, producer surplus or the profit of the monopolist. S, the blue area, is the consumer surplus, and D is the deadweight loss. 
Right now, with uniform pricing, the firm is making Pi M as a profit. But it can do better. Think about charging an additional fee on top of the price. It could charge a fee, for instance, which is equal to S. If consumers buy QM units of the good, they derive a consumer surplus equal to area S. This is extra utility on top of the price paid. So if the, if the company, if the monopolist charges a fixed fee on top of the uh, per unit price, and if the fixed fee is equal to S, then consumers are paying PM per unit plus area S as a fixed fee. This way, they will end up with no consumer surplus at all. However, D is still untouched. D is surplus that is not going to go to anybody. But there is a better way to shrink to reduce the size of D. Instead of charging a price equal to the monopoly price, which is very high and includes a, implies a low quantity being consumed, the monopolist could actually charge a lower price like P star to maximize the quantity being consumed and then charge a big fee equal to the consumer surplus. So charge the lowest minimum price, lowest possible price, marginal cost. Here, with just this, the monopolist is just able to pay back for the costs. He can pay his employees, his manager, his CEO, but the monopolist cannot, doesn't make any further money. But if the fixed fee is equal to the consumer surplus at that quantity, Q star, then the consumer surplus is this gigantic triangle here, this big blue triangle. If the monopolist charges this whole triangle as a fee, then it will make profit, extract all of the consumer surplus, and since all of this area becomes now surplus, there is no dead weight loss, and the outcome is actually Pareto efficient. Now, is this feasible? Well, if you want to charge an entry fee to each customer separately, then you need to look at the individual demand. So this here would be the individual demand. But if consumers are different, I might have a different demand than you guys. If we have a different demand, the monopolist cannot charge a different tariff here. Not yet. We are not at price discrimination yet. So the monopolist will charge the same two-part tariff to everybody. The quantity consumed will be efficient every time, but there might be a consumer or two who is going to end up with some surplus at the end. This method, where the monopolist can extract everybody's surplus, works only if all the consumers are the same. They are homogeneous. If they are the same, you charge the same fee to each, and they end up with no consumer surplus. So, since monopolies create inefficiencies, how can we solve that problem? The government can step in and divest some crucial inputs. I mentioned the railroad example before. Imagine that one company is building and maintaining the railroad network. Well, if you want to open the market to competition, you would need another firm to make its own network and maintain it. With competition, it will be very, very difficult, probably unsustainable. Rather, what a government can do is, is, is I'm going to own, I'm going to take, make possession of uh, the railroad and I'm going to rent its use to different companies so that two different train companies can use the same railroad at the same train station. It is the same with national airlines required to divest slots and gates in airports. Airports could be only used for national airlines, but they can also be open to other airline companies 
who are going to pay a certain fee to be allowed to take off and land um, at the airport. More generally, the government can try to encourage competition. For instance, it can give a favorable treatment in wireless spectrum auctions for new competitors. Wireless spectrum auctions are auctions organized for um, phone providers to get signal. Instead of allowing the same big brands, the same big companies uh, use that, uh, that spectrum, they could also open it to more companies so that there is more competition on the market. There could also be some sort of regulation, be it regarding the price or the quantity. The government could propose some price caps, so propose a limit or price ceiling, if you like, um, on the price that, that the monopolist can charge or require certain tasks from the monopolist and so on. Taxation could be another way. There are other considerations that allow monopolies to exist. For instance, I talked about natural monopolies before. It is simply naturally more efficient to have one firm produce all of the output in that type of industry. But the government can still step in and say, we allow you to be a monopolist, but we do now allow you to charge too high of a price. That would be a price cap type of regulation. Or the, mono the, the, the government could tell the monopolist what price to charge depending on the cost that the firm is facing and the um, profit market that the government is allowing the firm to make. That would be the cost plus regulation. The government can estimate that it takes, uh, it costs $10 to produce a unit of the good. They can tell the monopolist, we are going to allow you that much more profit. So to get this profit at this cost, you need to produce at this price and you need to produce that many units. The government could also make revenue through selling the right to form a monopoly. For instance, by wireless spectrum, toll highways. I talked about patents before. That's another way to encourage innovation. Innovation is, um, sorry, monopolies are dual in the sense that they are a necessary evil because if you want to give the private sector incentives to um, to innovate then you need to promise them you need to guarantee them a certain amount of profits if they succeed so we would like to avoid monopolies as much as possible some of them are unavoidable like natural monopolies or patents or um, copyright. Others can be regulated using either a price cap, price cap strategy or a cost plus um, strategy. And there are probably other strategies out there. Okay, let's move on to discrimination, but first I'm gonna take a break of five minutes. Okay, it's been five minutes already. So what is price discrimination? Price discrimination is the practice of selling the same product to different buyers at different prices. We also call this market segmentation. We distinguish three types. First degree price discrimination is also called perfect price discrimination. It consists in charging every consumer her or his reservation price. Reservation price is the maximum price consumers are willing to pay. But here, each consumer, they could even be different, will be, will be paying their reservation price. 
So consumers will pay a different price. Second degree is also called indirect price discrimination. In this type of price discrimination, consumers choose a price or quantity bundle proposed by the firm. The bundles are tailored towards accommodating for different consumers' preferences. And I'll go through an example in a minute. Finally, the third degree, uh, third degree price discrimination consists in charging consumers a different price based on the group they belong to or based on some observable characteristic. Let's jump right into first degree price discrimination. Every consumer will end up paying his or her disc the reservation price. This means that at the end of the day, consumers are left with no consumer surplus at all. Consider the graph, consider the right hand graph. This is the graph we saw before with a regular monopolist uniform pricing strategy. And we saw that the red area was the producer surplus. Now, imagine that this demand is actually the demand of one customer, not aggregate. On the left graph, the whole area has become red because the monopolist has managed to extract all of the consumer surplus. How did he achieve that? He proposed a price equal to marginal cost, that's a per unit price, thanks to which he could sell Q star units. At this stage, his profit is equal to this red triangle, but he's going to charge a fixed fee on top of it to extract all of the, cor all of the corresponding consumer surplus. So a two part tariff can be used here. And because it's a case of perfect price discrimination, the monopolist can use a different two part tariff for each type of customer. But the formula is always the same. Charge the lowest possible price, price equals marginal cost, so that the efficient quantity is being consumed, and then charge a fixed fee on top of it, which is equal to the consumer surplus derived at that quantity. Consumers end up indifferent between buying the good and not buying the good. Either they buy, they enjoy the good, but they pay the huge price, or they did not buy the good and did not enjoy, uh, not enjoy, did not enjoy the good and did not pay the price. In both cases, they are left with a consumer surplus of zero. The monopolist can decrease the price by a cent to make sure that the, the consumer strictly prefers to consume versus not consume. And as you can see on the left graph, there is no green area. There is no dead weight loss. So perfect price discrimination is Pareto efficient. But the monopolies extract all of the surplus. It is Pareto efficient in the sense that once you're here, if you want to make anybody better off, you'll have to make somebody worse off. If you want to increase the surplus of the consumer, you're going to have to take some of the surplus of the producer. There is no allocation that will make one person better off without making the other one worse off. In the monopoly case, we said that another allocation where those extra units of the good are sold at different prices would make both consumers and producers better off. But because the rule is uniform pricing, those units will not be traded, and hence the dead weight loss. In real life, there are no really case of perfect price discrimination. This is a benchmark. It's a theoretical uh, benchmark um, to play with. The idea is that if I am charged a different price than my friends, what could be the reason? Yes, it could be that I am willing to pay more for the good, 
but it, maybe I can make an argument that they are charging me a higher price because I'm a man or because I'm white or because I'm French or because of anything else. Perfect price discrimination is closely related to phase discrimination. Charging somebody a lower price than somebody else could be justified by many arguments. And it is also not really feasible because it is impossible for a monopolist to know everybody's reservation price, everybody's willingness to pay. This demand here is something which is very hard to obtain for each consumer. Firms can sometimes obtain a, an aggregate demand where they know overall the quantity that is going to be consumed at each price using some data, but they will never obtain each individual demand curve, especially if they try asking consumers. If they ask consumers, consumers will never report how much they're willing to pay for the good. They're going to report less. So it's a benchmark. Not very realistic, but it helps us compare this type of price discrimination with second degree and third degrees, which are implemented way more in reality. With indirect price discrimination, the price is based on choices made by consumers. So this practice works through self-selection. The idea is that the monopolist is going to design one specific bundle for each type of customer he knows. He doesn't know what type each customer is. Are you the one with this demand or that kind of demand or that willingness to pay? He doesn't know. It only knows that there are some people with those demands out there. So he's going to design bundles to make sure that each person with a specific demand is going to buy a very particular bundle. Consumers will pick the package they prefer the most. And by picking this package, they are going to reveal what type of consumers they are. By doing this, the monopolist will be able to extract additional consumer surplus, although he won't be able to extract all of the consumer surplus. The advantage of this method is that there is no need for directly identifying demand groups. The monopolist doesn't need to tell, doesn't need to tell apart consumers. He only knows there are this type, this type, and this type. If there are three types, he's going to make three bundles and he's going to make sure that each bundle is going to be picked by a different type of consumer. The potential problem with this practice is arbitrage. It's a French word. So arbitrage consists in buying a low price to resell. If you are the type of customer who's going to pick the bundle, which is cheaper, you might have an incentive to resell this bundle to somebody else that would have to pay a higher price otherwise. In this case, the monopolist will sell only to one customer the one who's going to buy the good for cheap and the other customer will have access to the good through um, through arbitrage. So when we talk about price discrimination, we need to make sure that arbitrage is not in the way. Let's go through a simple example. Buy one, get the second one for half price. BOGO, B-O-G-O, is an example of second degree price discrimination. Tim Hortons makes sandwiches at a marginal cost of $2. They also offer another package, a bundle, that consists in buying one sandwich full price and the second sandwich for 50% of the price. Why do they propose such a bundle? That's because there are two types of consumers here. Two bundles, two consumers, and more if needed. Assume we have two types of customers, Henry and Larry. They each have a different willingness to pay for the goods, for sandwiches. 
Henry is willing to pay $8 for the first sandwich and $4 for the second sandwich. Remember, the law of diminishing marginal utility is such that any extra consumption brings less utility than the previous unit. Larry is not so hungry, so he's only willing to pay $6 for a sandwich, for the first, and $2 for the second sandwich. So we just have two types of customers, okay? And Tim Hortons doesn't have any knowledge about who is who, doesn't know who Henry is, doesn't know who Larry is. So let's compare three different uh, pricing strategies. The first one is uniform linear pricing. What you can do here is charge $6 per sandwich. In this case, Henry is going to buy one sandwich because he's willing to pay $8 for a sandwich, but four for a second. So he's not willing to pay $6 for a second sandwich. He's only going to buy one. Larry is willing to pay $6 for the first sandwich. So $6 it is. Each is going to buy one sandwich. So the profit is going to be $6 times two because two sandwiches are being sold minus two, the marginal cost times two sandwiches to make. That's equal to 12 minus 4, which is equal to 8. That's the profit made on Henry and Larry under uniform pricing. Now, let's put some perfect price discrimination in it, some first degree. So first degree is the case where Tim Hortons knows exactly who is Henry, who is Larry. When Tim Hortons sees Henry, it's like, I can charge you a high price because I know you're hungry. And when it sees Larry, it's like, ah, I know you're willing to pay $6 for the sandwich only. So I'll charge you something lower or equal to that. With perfect price discrimination, then, Tim Hortons can charge $8 to Henry and $6 to Larry. In this case, they're each going to buy one sandwich. In this case, the profit is going to be 8 plus 6 minus 2 times 2, minus the cost of making two sandwiches. So the cost hasn't changed, but now Tim Hortons is able to extract two more dollars from the hungry customer, Henry. And so profit is $10, which is higher than before. Now, this is a benchmark, because obviously in real life, Tim Hortons is not able to tell who is hungry and who is not. So instead, it just knows that there are some hungry people, there are some non-hungry people. So with indirect price discrimination, Tim Hortons is going to propose two different bundles because there are two different types of people. The first bundle says $6 a sandwich, period. That's the bundle. One sandwich, $6. The second one is the BOGO offer, the BOGO offer. Charge $6 for the first sandwich and $3 for the second sandwich. So you can either pay $6 and get one sandwich or pay $9, six plus three, to get two sandwiches. Who's gonna buy what? Well here, at this price of $9 for two sandwiches, Henry is willing to pay because Henry is willing to pay eight plus four dollars. So Henry is willing to pay twelve dollars in total for two sandwiches. If the price is nine dollars, sure, he's gonna go for it. So Henry gets the bundle of two sandwiches, but that bundle costs nine dollars. Larry is only willing to pay eight dollars for two sandwiches. So Larry will not get that combo, rather he's gonna stick to only one sandwich. So in total, Tim Hortons is going to sell two sandwiches to Henry, one sandwich to, to Larry for a total of three sandwiches, two of them for $6, one of them for $3. So six times two, which are the first sandwiches of Henry and Larry, plus the second sandwich of Henry, minus 
the cost of making three sandwiches and the whole profit amounts to nine dollars nine dollars is higher than the um, initial eight of course it remains lower than the ten dollars made under perfect price discrimination You can find examples of indirect price discrimination all the time in real life. Any store that proposes quantity discounts, coupons, are different ways to propose different bundles to different customers. The ones who buy more and collect coupons, air miles, uh, save on points card, next Nestor's points card, the PC Optimum card, and so on, are customers who tend to have a higher elasticity of demand. They react more to a high price, so they gather all these coupons and uh, points card, fidelity points and so on to benefit from lower prices. Families and consumers with a low value for time are more price sensitive than individuals. So they're the ones who are gonna gather, um, who are going to gather, take the time to gather all of those coupons in order to benefit from a lower price. Rate plans and communications. Those who demand more pay a higher fixed fee and a lower marginal price. If your phone package includes uh, six gigabytes of data, unlimited text and limited calls, and you pay, let's say, $50, $40, then going from this package to the next package, which is $70, where there are like 10 gigabytes of data, include a very low marginal price, but the fixed fee increased by a lot. Phone, uh, phone plans have a lot of different options. I am on the option, I am on the low end option. I have the cheaper bundle with Kudo. I pay $15 a month for unlimited texting. And that's it. And then you have bundles used to attract those who are willing to pay more. Note, by the way, that the $15 uh, bundle, the one I have with Kudo, is not here to make me purchase. It is here to make um, the cheap bundle very crappy. And here is the intuition. If you want consumers to buy a more expensive bundle, you have two ways. Either you make this bundle bigger, you add more features, more data, more calls, and so on, or you make the other options, the cheaper options, really, really bad. By doing this, anybody who needs a bit of data, just a bit, will never buy my bundle, the $15, Rather, they're going to go to the next bundle that has data, and then you have to start paying $25 or $30. So, in general, the cheap bundles are here to make the cheap option bad enough so that some consumers will decide to buy a better option. In planes, in the 60s or 70s, there used to be only one type of seat everywhere. You can call this middle class. Since then, they have um, separated um, seats by class. We have the business class, the first class, we have the second class, and we have the economy class. The economy class is not as comfortable as the middle class seat from the 70s. The point of the economy class is to make seats very narrow, to reduce space between seats so that anybody who cannot sit in a plane in those conditions for uh, the duration of a flight will decide to buy second class or first class. As an example, my dad doesn't like narrow spaces. He used to fly on economy class for a long time because he just he was looking for the cheap flights, but now he's 65, he doesn't fly right now, but if he needs to, he said, I'm gonna just buy first class from now on. I won't fly very often, I'm retired, and 
you know, spending nine hours in a plane to cross an ocean or something like that in a very narrow seat is not for all the people. That's second degree price discrimination. My father has a higher willingness to pay. He would like to get a cheap seat, but since the cheap seat is really, really bad, then he will just ignore that type of seat and will go for the more expensive seats. Tie-in sales. Many products are tie-in, in the sense that to consume one product, you need to buy an other product. So that leads to the creation of many other types of bundles. I'm thinking about video games and consoles in particular, or video formats. If you want to play a Blu-ray, you need a Blu-ray reader. Around 15 years ago, yeah, 15 years ago, um, when Blu-rays started coming out, there was a war between Blu-rays by Sony and HDVD by Philips. The quality of movies were, uh, the quality was good, was pretty much the same with both formats. It's just that if you wanted to read a Blu-ray uh, DVD, you needed either a PlayStation 3 or um, a specific reader, as opposed to another type of reader for HDVD. It turns out over time, Sony won the race, so that now the HDVD format doesn't exist anymore, it's only uh, Blu-ray, and then there is a Blu-ray 4K and, I don't know, high definition uh, Blu-ray versions now. Higher definitions. It was already high definition before. Bundling is another form of indirect price discrimination. Those who want one product have to purchase another one at a price higher than their reservation price. For instance, when you buy a bundle for, for, the, for cable, you might only be interested in a couple of channels, but you might end up buying all of those extra channels on the side. Or you can eat. You won't eat everything. You might be interested in only a couple of dishes, but you're going to buy, you might buy the all you can eat. Um, you might take that all, the all you can eat option. Microsoft Office is similar. If you are only interested in Microsoft Office for a specific uh, software, let's say Microsoft Excel or PowerPoint or Word, but only one of them, you cannot buy them separately, I believe. You have to buy the whole bundle, which costs more than $100. Now, let me switch to third degree price discrimination, which is also called direct price discrimination. This one is called direct because now the monopolist can charge a price based on the identity of the demand group. So it's based on observable consumer characteristics. For instance, if the monopolist can tell students apart from the rest of the population, or if the monopolist can uh, tell seniors apart from the rest of the population. Sometimes a demand group could be attached to a location. A monopolist might want to sell a product, the same product, to Canada and to the US. But Canadians might have a different aggregate demand than Americans. For this, you need to be able to identify consumer types. So location is um, an automatic way to do it. Students and seniors are actually um, are also possible to implement. You can require student ID to propose student pricing to some consumers, or you can ask to show any sort of ID that shows age for seniors to benefit from a discount. So you need to identify consumer type. You need to enforce it one way or another. I just mentioned this with the ID card or the student ID. You need to be able to prevent arbitrage, of course, as usual. If seniors can get a movie ticket for a lower price, they might get a movie ticket, might go outside and resell the movie ticket to younger kids who have to pay full price. The young kids end up paying a price which is lower than what they would have to pay from the movie theater. And the, um, the senior who got a ticket can make a little profit. 
if the monopolist can distinguish different groups, then it's going to exploit different elasticities using different inverse elasticity rules to increase its profits. So, if the monopolist can price discriminate here, what price should it charge? So imagine that we have two different um, consumer groups or markets. The inverse demand of group one is P1 equals 100 minus Q. And for group two, the inverse demand is 50 minus one half of Q. The firm has a marginal cost of 20. So it will set up the profit as follows. The profit will be, will be equal to total revenue generated by selling to the first demand group plus total revenue generated by selling to the second group minus the cost of producing to both groups. Note that the profit function now depends on Q1 and Q2. So the monopolist is going to look for two variables, two quantities. Once the quantities are found, they can be plugged into the respective inverse demand functions to get the corresponding optimal prices. Two variables to find, two first order conditions. The derivative of pi with respect to Q1 and Q2 should be set to zero, but it is set to zero only at the optimal quantities that I call Q1 star and Q2 star. Note that we have two equations, two unknowns, but each equation only has one unknown. So they can be solved separately. That's a special case. If the cost function is not linear, if let's say it is Q1 plus Q2 squared, then in the derivative, once you take the first order conditions, each equation would contain both Q1 and Q2, and you will have to solve a system of two equations, two unknowns, simultaneously. Here, solving for Q1 and Q2 yields Q1 star is equal to 40, Q2 star is equal to 30, P1 star is equal to 60, P2 star is equal to 35. Couple of things to say here. First of all, group one is going to consume more than group two, but they are also charged a higher price than, than group two. How come they are not only consuming more, but also paying a higher price? Well, it's because group one is has just a different demand on group two. You can look at the intercept first of all. The intercept 100 is twice as high as 50. So when Q is equal to zero, we are looking at the price that consumers are willing to pay for the first unit of the good. Group one consumers will be willing to pay $100, whereas group two consumers would be willing to pay only $50. Note, furthermore, that the slope of group two, uh, group two demand is flatter than the slope of group one demand. This means that group one also has a more inelastic demand than group two. So not only group one is willing to pay more, just in absolute terms, because the intercept is higher, but also their elasticity is lower. So they are going to be charged a higher price, but they will still consume more than group two. Hence this result. Computing profits, plugging Q1 star, Q2 star in the profit function yields $2,050. Now let's compare this with a case where the firm cannot price discriminate. The firm has no way, the monopolist has no way to figure out uh, how to impose a price on one consumer versus another. Then the monopolist needs to compute the aggregate demand function. I'm going to assume here, just for simplicity, that both groups consume. So for both groups to consume, if you look at the individual demands here, first, you need to compute Q as a function of P. 
So you can put Q on the other side of the equation and isolate for Q. And you will see that in the case of group two, if the price is 50 or more, the quantity consumed is going to be zero. Here, I want to assume that both groups are going to consume, which is the same as assuming that the price is lower than 50. If it's lower than 50, you can add both demands together. Remember, we cannot add inverse demands. We don't add prices. We can add quantities. But price is always one price. So if you want to compute the aggregate demand, you need to find the direct demand, Q as a function of P. Then you can add them up. And this is the overall demand as a function of the price, if the price is lower than 50. From there, then, you can compute the inverse demand again and get P as a function of Q, Q being the aggregate quantity. Now we have the demand. We can find the profit function and we can solve the first order condition. There is only one. QU here represents U for uniform. So the um, uniform, pricing op uniform pricing optimal quantity will be 70. The corresponding price, PU, will be 43.33. Note that it is a coincidence that the uniform quantity here is 70, whereas before it was 40 and 30, which also add up to 70. It is a coincidence. Here, if you plug, oops, if you plug this price of 43.33 into the demand functions here and here, you will not obtain 30 and 40. You're going to obtain different amounts. Finally, the profit can be obtained by plugging the result in the profit function. And you can see that the profit now is way lower than before. It was $2,050 in the previous slide. It is now $1,633.33. So the monopolist total profit is higher when it can price discriminate than when it cannot. So if the monopolist can price discriminate, he will try to do so. We've seen that monopoly in general leads to Pareto, uh, to a Pareto inefficient outcome or if a market failure. What about price discrimination? We are still talking about um, a monopolist here. We saw, however, that with first degree price discrimination, total welfare was maximized. So the outcome was Pareto efficient, although consumers were not getting anything. In general, if the monopolist produces less than under uniform pricing, welfare is lower overall. But if the firm produces more than uniform pricing, welfare may be higher. For instance, perfect price discrimination. The quantity sold is the competitive quantity and total surplus is higher. But that also works in the case of third degree price discrimination. To give you an example, here, if I want to go watch a movie, I have to pay 12 or $13 for a ticket. And that's not even counting for 3D, DMAX, and so on. That's a uniform price. I don't have any, well, I don't have any student discounts for it. Back home, when I did my studies in France, the city had a student discount that made students pay only four or four euro fifty for a movie ticket. Same conditions. So four euros, four euro fifty represents six fifty or seven dollars. Okay, Canadian dollars. I can tell you I was going to the movie theater way more back then than I am now. So the discount is tend the discount is going to benefit the poor. Price discrimination in general is going to benefit the poor because the monopolist is going to, by discriminating, is going to charge a lower price to elastic demands and 
poor demands. So those people are going to buy more than under uniform pricing. And on the other hand, it tends to hurt the rich. They want to extract a surplus from the rich, so they're going to force the rich or the more inelastic demand groups to pay a higher price. So on one hand, I am happy because I could use my, my student discounts back home in France. At the same time, because of that, people who were paying for a regular ticket were paying a higher price than under uniform pricing. Under uniform pricing, the price would probably be something in the middle, like 43. This 43 here is between 35 and 60. It's not a perfect average, but it's just something in, in between. Total surplus, however, might increase because thanks to the discount, thanks to the price discrimination, some consumers might actually start consuming. Under uniform pricing, some people might not even go to the movies back home in France. Thanks to the discount, they are, not, they are now going. And both groups here are under third degree price discrimination. All demand groups um, derive some consumer surplus. Okay? It's very important. First degree price discrimination, no surplus for consumers. Firm gets everything, probably too efficient. Second degree price discrimination, some consumers get some surplus, some consumers end up with zero surplus. The firm is not fully able to extract the consumer surplus. Third degree price discrimination, consumers are left with some surplus again, but the firm is definitely making more profits than under uniform pricing. Let me summarize things a bit. So we talked about uh, monopolists. We talked about their objective and their sources. Sources can come from uh, various places. Sometimes it's due to uh, the government, by law, by policy. A firm can be allowed to be a monopolist. Sometimes it's due to the structure of the market. I talked about natural monopoly. I talked about uh, network externalities or network effects that um, that favor um, firms which are ahead in terms of quantity. So the bigger platform will win in a race for network effect. If the bigger platform can manage to maintain its, uh, its attendance, then eventually all the other platforms are going to disappear. In the case of a natural monopoly, it is simply more efficient to have one firm produce all for all of the market than multiple firms producing quantities on their own simply because of a cost uh, feature. And finally, I talked about sometimes uh, monopolies can arise from firms' actions. It can be the control of inputs or resources. The beer is an example in the diamond industry. Or it could be some um, cost efficiency uh, some cost efficiencies uh, that allow some firms to adopt predatory behaviors to drive all the other competitors away. We went over the basic model and found that the monopolist will choose to uh, will choose the quantity that maximizes profits and this quantity is such that marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. That's when the monopolist is using uniform pricing. From that condition, we also found that at the optimum for a monopolist, that's very important, the inverse elasticity rule is going to be satisfied. The learner index on the left, which is a measure of market power, price cost margin or relative markup, is equal to the inverse of the elasticity. Thanks to that, we saw that the monopolist behavior is going to depend on the elasticity of the demand. So a monopoly might have market power, being the only one to produce on the market, but it is restricted by the demand. 
He cannot charge a price which is too high because otherwise the quantity will go um, will be too low and its profits will decrease. I also mentioned that a monopolist always produces in the portion of the demand where elasticity is bigger than one, so where the demand is pretty elastic. The reason being that if it's selling at a point where the demand is not very elastic, then the monopolist can increase the price without losing too much quantity and increase its profits. Eventually, it will not go to where total revenue is maximized because at the end of the day, the monopolist is not maximizing total revenue, it's maximizing profit. And profit is total revenue minus cost, which is why the optimal point is also on the left of the top of total revenue. We went over a couple of elasticity estimates that probably are going to change now. For instance, uh, I can draw your attention to the elasticity for movies. It is relatively inelastic. I mean, it's just below unitary elasticity, so it's considered inelastic. But I'm pretty sure that nowadays, especially with the times we are going through right now, the elasticity of demand for movies is probably now around 1.52 or even more. Why? Two things. Global pandemic is limiting social interactions. So uh, many, many people might not uh, want to go watch a movie if it's that expensive, given the conditions. The other reason is there is a lot of on-demand movies now. If you guys have a subscription to Netflix, HBO Max, um, Crave, Amazon Prime, and so on, you have access to a lot of movies. And the quality is very good. The sound systems have very good quality nowadays. So that might be one more reason for you guys to stay um, at home rather than going to the movie theater. So I talked about the inefficiency coming from uniform pricing in Monopoly, this green area, the dead weight loss. The outcome is not very too efficient, remember, because consumers will be willing to purchase those extra units and producers would be willing to sell those extra units, but that's only if the price is lower than PM. If the price is lower than PM, because we are in a case of uniform pricing, then that would include lowering the, um, lowering the, um, the overall price, which would decrease the monopolist profit. So the whole point is, if each unit until QM is priced at PM and those extra units are being sold for a bit less than PM, then we could make both the consumers and the monopolist better off. Which is why we have a dead weight loss. I mentioned the use of a two-part tariff by the monopolist to increase its profits. If this demand is a, an individual demand, the demand for by one person, then the monopolist can actually charge a lower price per unit, the lowest possible price per unit, P star, and then charge a huge fee equal to those three areas together, S plus pi M plus D. In this case, the monopolist would be able to extract all of the surplus of that consumer, which is technically Pareto efficient, but it only works with homogeneous consumers. If consumers are different, then the monopolist will not be able to extract the full consumer surplus every time, and sometimes some consumers might actually decide to not buy. So this is a two-part tariff, but the same two-part tariff is imposed on everybody. I talked about different forms of regulation that can be used by, um, by governments. Sometimes monopolies are inevitable, so they are a necessary evil. I talked about the case of patents, copyrights, and so on. In the case of natural monopolies, they can be regulated through price caps, like a ceiling on the price of the product to make sure the monopolist doesn't charge a price which is too high, or a cost plus strategy that consists in looking, estimating the cost of production of the firm, 
taking into, a, taking into account a certain amount of profit that the firm can make and find the corresponding price and quantity that the firm would need to decide or that the monopolist would need to decide to make that profit. Those measures are not perfect. For instance, price caps is not perfect because some firms might not be able to survive with a price cap, especially firms undergoing some shock. Let's say there is a crisis, but they still cannot increase the price of their good. And <clears throat> cost plus strategies are hard to implement because they require a good an accurate estimate of a firm's cost. Firm's costs in general are very hard to um, estimate in particular because they don't disclose those numbers publicly. Moreover, this type of strategy also gives incentives to the monopolist to um, over report their cost. They might say that it costs them $100 to make a phone, whereas it only takes them $50. The idea is that by saying to the government that it takes $100, the government will then allow them to charge a higher price. Then I went to price discrimination. First degree consists in being able to apply a tariff such that there is no consumer left with consumer surplus. So it is probably too efficient. It is very hard to implement in real life though, because it necessitates knowing each consumer's individual demand. So note that this here on the left graph shows like an individual demand. Second degree is called indirect price discrimination, consists in making a certain bundle price quantity package for each type of consumers out there. And consumers will choose those bundles themselves so that the firm doesn't need to identify who is what type. They just need to know what types they are. Remember that arbitrage can also can always be a problem. I mentioned the example of Tim Hortons proposing two different bundles to two different types of customers. In real life, Tim Hortons has more bundles than this. In fact, I don't even know if they still have the buy one, get second one off, but they do have sometimes two breakfast sandwiches for $5 versus one for 350 or something. They also have breakfast combo, lunch combo, they have Timbits combo, and so on and so forth. All of those different combinations and menus are here or there to extract surplus from different types of consumers. When you go to McDonald's and you order a burger and they suggest you, hey, do you want to make it a combo? Add some fries and add, add a drink. They propose you this combo because even though you might not be interested in uh, the drink that much, with the fries, the combo overall becomes kind of cheaper per unit. It's cheaper than buying one burger plus a side of fries plus a drink. I went through a couple of examples and then I went into third degree price discrimination, something we see a lot regarding age senior pricing, kid pricing for uh, resort, uh, for um, resorts and amusement parks. Students can benefit from a, a discount. Sometimes markets can be separated by location. We still have to prevent arbitrage one way or another. And we, the monopolist must be able to enforce this pricing strategy. The monopolist must be able to tell, yes, you, I can give you the discount because you are a student. So in this case, being Canadian versus being American is easy to verify. Being a student is easy to verify with a student ID and being a senior is easy to verify with a regular piece of ID indicating age. This way, the monopolist will pretty much do his usual uniform pricing on each group. So all the seniors will have a per unit price and all the other people will have another per unit price. This way, the monopolist can exploit different elasticities to increase its profits. It turns out that price discrimination can have positive impacts on welfare, on total surplus. 
interestingly. If production increases thanks to the uh, price discrimination as opposed to uniform pricing, then welfare increases. It's a general rule. Remember, some people were not willing to consume a lot or not consume at all under uniform pricing, but now that a monopolist is discriminating, those consumers are willing to purchase a positive amount of the good. That's it for this lecture on monopoly and price discrimination. Have a good rest of your week and see you in the next one. Bye.